Do the old one? I got it. Okay. It's a low couch. We got four viewers. <laughs> four viewers. Sweet. All right. You guys can close the door if you want. Unless you want to hang out of here and troll. <laughs> I guess you want to troll. Okay. Guess we should dig into the original Reddit thread. Yeah. Let's see what's like top voted. Uh, <laughs> what ideas? Okay. So, hey everyone. Hi. Hi, hi four people out there. Four viewers, thanks for tuning in on time. You guys are very <laughs> punctual. Should we, do we have the um, Reddit thread and the YouTube like yeah, comment? I got it. Okay. What? It's a low couch. We have four oh. viewers. Oh, I have the video. Oh, open. it's delayed. <laughs> it was delayed by like 40 seconds. Uh, okay. Do we, do we have the. Um, yeah, let me send it to you. The original. I think other people are watching it over there. All right, so I'll send you on hip chat here, Fred. Let's close the All right, so let's jump into question number one. Yeah, so it's basically like consumers don't have a um, any reason to pay in Bitcoin because you get frequent flyer miles and other like cashback stuff with credit cards. So, like, why would you pay with Bitcoin? Basically, mm. any thoughts? Any yeah. Yeah, there's a few questions or a few answers to that. So <laughs> many open questions here. A lot of open questions. Um, so I mean, the first thing is, of course, you know, credit cards have that high fee, right? And a lot of people think the merchant's paying it, and they are, but really, the consumer's paying for it also, right? In terms of having a higher cost that's baked into everything that they're paying. So if you think of that as like a pie, that can kind of get redistributed back to people, however, however it gets divided up. There's a lot of pie to go around, right? So. You know, I think uh, Chris Dixon had this great blog post that uh, all payments is a $500 billion industry in the U.S., which means all those little fees that you sum up from people taking credit card transaction fees, FX fees, Western Union, whatever, is a $500 billion industry every year. You could probably take $450 billion of that at least and kind of return it back to consumers or merchants in one way, shape, or form. So that's how exactly it happens. Reward points, that kind of thing. Um, or even straight, straight cash back is a decent option too, right? Like, yeah. I think Overstock is doing 1% cash back in like O dollars right now, which is still in network, but it wouldn't surprise me if people just started as, as the fees get dramatically lower and Bitcoin volume goes up. It wouldn't surprise me if it became a standard for merchants just to give one or 2% off for saying Bitcoin in the first place. Yeah. I agree. Internally toyed around with the idea of just like making that the default in the merchant tools. It's like, do you want to give people 1% cash back or 2% cash back? And like, there's a little, oh, this is Brian's idea, but a little option at the bottom where it's like, no, I don't want to give any discount where it makes it, it makes it almost seem as if like nobody should choose that option because you're saving less you should be giving back. Yeah. Well, we got a question from Twitter here from a uh, Doge car fan. He says, adopting other cryptocurrencies only has advantages for you. Why don't you do it? And by the way, where can I get that awesome Bitcoin pillow? Um, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, as you guys know, we hired Charlie Lee. He's like the creator of Litecoin, right? So that's a pretty big altcoin. We like altcoins. Um, I got to say, you know, we, a lot of the conversations we have is with people with, you know, like big retailers like Dell and Expedia or big banks. And we have to do a lot of education out there, I guess you could say. Um, also with regulators and telling them about Bitcoin and how the benefits it can bring. So sometimes there's a bit of a learning curve to Bitcoin. If you go back and you think about the first time you heard about Bitcoin, it probably took you three, four months to understand it. And so we, we kind of try to um, make that. And we, we think that adding other altcoins could make that a bit of a harder conversation at the moment. Um, there's, really, there's, a, there's a lot of altcoins coming out that offer kind of or could offer some new benefits that are really interesting. And those are the things that we kind of want to watch as early adopters. Like if there's an altcoin comes out that is doing something really new and different, um, we'll add it. You know, we already are a multi-currency site. We've got euros, we've got Bitcoin. Um, we we wouldn't mind adding something different, but I don't know. Fred, what do you think? What do you think about altcoins? Yeah, no, I mean, I think like, you think about like what we're trying to accomplish. It's basically bringing Bitcoin to the mainstream in the best way possible, right? Or sorry, I guess digital currency more broadly. And it happens to be Bitcoin that's like the implementation. So, yeah, I think like 
I would think about it almost on like the consumer side. It's basically like if you want people to start using digital currency, it's pretty difficult to get them to understand one. One um, adding more just adds to the complexity. It's not to say that it, like it won't happen at some point in time. Um, yeah, but it's 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 really just like thinking about the average person who's never used or heard of digital currency before, and thinking like, oh, would, should this person be presented with? Like a ton of options right now, probably not for the first round experience, at least. Fred, this is a good question. I got um, someone here saying, uh, "Why is there de a delay in getting Bitcoin um, after I've deposited funds?" Mm, so TLDR is basically existing banking rails are kind of slow. Um, so yeah, like it's it's ironic because like the same thing is true with money coming in. It runs over the system called ACH, which is um, stands for automated clearinghouse, but it's like the bank to bank transfer network in the US. So when you buy some Bitcoin on the site, some dollars travel from your bank account to Coinbase, um, and it goes over this system where uh, it kind of takes a while, basically. It takes a couple of business days, um, which is obviously like why we believe in Bitcoin in the first place, because it lets you send things, well, depending on your view on confirmation time and all that stuff within a couple of minutes and it doesn't matter on weekends and all that good stuff. Yeah, I guess we should mention, you can do instant buys of Bitcoin as well on Coinbase. You have to add a backup payment method, which we accept credit cards for that. Um, so we want to make that easier. Um, you know, it's really, there are a lot of Bitcoin companies out there which kind of don't exist anymore or they maybe never got started because it actually is really difficult to accept uh, reversible payment methods for, for Bitcoin in return because Bitcoin, of course, is non-reversible which is a nice property of it, but um, the any time that you kind of open up a business and you allow people to pay with credit cards or bank transfers or anything that's reversible, you're gonna kind of get everyone and their mother out there coming to the site to try to put in stolen credentials or you know that sort of thing. And there's a, it's a really hard problem. There's a lot of companies that have just gone out of business if they can't keep that to a manageable level. So, look, we we're sorry. Like we, <laughs> it, nothing makes us feel worse than having like a legitimate user get caught up in some process where you have to jump through a bunch. Of we also sometimes look at the end of the month and we're like, oh my gosh, like look at look at all this fraud which almost happened on the site. And um, if, the, if it comes down to us being insolvent or going bankrupt or being able to continue to run a profitable business, like that's that's the choice we have to make. So there's a lot of our jobs as founders, honestly, is like who do we who do we want to disappoint the least is like a lot of the decisions we have to make, which is um, not always an easy position to be in, but you know. Just a full transparency. We're we're a lot bigger by headcount now. We've got about fifty people that work at Coinbase. But back in the days of like, oh my God, my and not that like I, I take this super seriously. Actually, not that it was. It's totally legitimate gripe that people were angry about transfers being canceled. This is like um, early twenty thirteen kind of time frame. It sucked. Like it definitely wore on me a little bit emotionally, to be honest. Oh yeah, um, I feel the same. I I still have the emotional scars from that time period. I feel like in 2013 era. That was there were some dark days there. Yeah, I mean, it, basically, what we tried to do at the time was error. On the, like we we tried to just push a lot of those through. For example, anyway, even though we were kind of eating the cost. Um, and thankfully, like that problem has gotten um, significantly easy. Well, it, we've gotten all a lot better at it, basically. So you don't see it crop up it anymore. But yeah, it's definitely like it's that was definitely um, that was definitely like a rough uh, a rough period. But yeah. I'm, I'm glad that like that's mostly in the rearview mirror. I think. Yeah, the interwebs can be a, uh, a cruel place sometimes, <laughs> and like honestly, that's part of the reason why we wanted to do this AMA because I feel like. A lot of people have never really met us or whatever, and they see only things happening about on the internet about Coinbase, or they have this really kind of cold interaction that's only through email with the company. And um, you know, I guess we just wanted to let people know, you know like we're trying our best. Like we're, we're we don't have it all figured out. We're we're young dudes like trying to get through this and build something awesome that survives the test of time. So um, anyway, before this gets too weepy, let's. <laughs> Let's move here's, on. Here, I mean, here's a good one kind of on that topic. Okay, okay, so. Oh, and by the way, anybody out there, you can tweet at Coinbase and ask a question. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Yeah, I'm mainly reading the, the Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. So um, from Polly Paradigm, um, will you be adding a phone line and higher-end customer service? Mm. 
You know, we thought about that a lot. Um, we have a customer support number right now, but it really just asks people to submit through the website. The, um, the downside of it is, like, I feel like, you know, there, there's a lot of websites that I've used, and the minute I have to, like, call somebody on the phone for support, I feel like something has already kind of gone wrong. You know, like, I, I just want to get done whatever I'm trying to get done and not have to talk to somebody on the phone. So we kind of feel like that's maybe a little bit of an old-fashioned um, version of, of support. If you really want to get something done, you, you can use, uh, quickly, you can use live chat. We actually offer that. I think live chat is actually a lot better than customer support, not only from an efficiency point of view, be having conversations with multiple people at the same time, but and you can get an immediate response. But, um, you know, yeah, phone support is a tough one. I, the sort of, uh, I don't know, I don't, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I think it's not as efficient, and it's, and it's the future of support is not going to be that. Also, to the prior question, I'm trying to figure out where we got the pillows, by the way. I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I think we bought them in Bitcoin somewhere. Yeah, we bought them with Bitcoin somewhere. So if anybody knows, put it out on uh, <laughs> Twitter, maybe. Yeah. Um, here's a good one, Fred. You ready for this? Sure, we got um, Do you share all information about your customers with the U.S. government? So the answer, the answer is no. Um, a couple of ways to think about this, I guess. Um, I think like a lot of the Bitcoin community is obviously super privacy focused. And um, I feel like I am more than the average person, too. Um, it's probably just because we work on Bitcoin stuff, so I think we, we happen to be more aware of the issues around that maybe than the average person. Um, short answer is no. Um, there, I mean, like, you can always get into, it, it's kind of like, um, I guess it's kind of like Google in this sense, right, where, like, under, like, federal grand jury subpoena, like, you don't have a choice. Um, but we basically do everything we can to not do that. Um, it might also be worth mentioning the multi-sig stuff too, actually, as kind of a step in that direction. Yeah, we could talk about that. I mean, I want to mention too, like we've, um, you know, the EFF is here in San Francisco, right? We actually, we went down and talked to them briefly about it, tried to get educated on it. We look at what other companies do, like Fred said, Google in the space and people like that. I think there's a balance, right? Like if someone is submitting something that's totally overreached, Give us information on any customer who's like, you know, age 25 to 35 or something. Obviously, that's something that we would push back on forcefully if we had to. And that's what most companies right now in Silicon Valley are doing, making an effort in that direction. And I think also an effort towards more transparency. So we're, we're believers in that, like, you know, sharing statistics and things like that about how many of those things that are out there. But um, we're big supporters of that. We want to move more in that direction. But we made this choice up front when we started the business. We said, Look, the best way to help Bitcoin grow is we need to have easy ability for people to get money into and out of the system. And for us, that means closing deals with banks here in the US, in Europe, um, making easy payment methods for people to get in and out of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And as a result of that, we have to um, comply with certain regulations, but it doesn't mean we have to go beyond that or you know make it onerous for our customers. So this is um, these are the hard decisions that, that we have to make. And, you know. I think it's I think it's a really valid question. Like we ask ourselves that question actually a lot internally about are we making the right choice? Like there's two sides of this line that we could end up on. So um, let's, let's go see. to let's go to Twitter here. Yeah. Um. <laughs> hmm. Let's think about it. Global Bitcoin Powerball. I think that's like a gambling thing. I'm uh, like Powerball is like it's like the state lottery in New York. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like Satoshi Dice sort of, sort of did that at one point in time. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. I go. I mean, I guess the difference is Powerball is like everybody pools money into one kind of grand prize, and people get um, lottery tickets from it. It's definitely an interesting idea. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we would necessarily be the ones to to watch it. Not necessarily our core focus, but it could be cool. Yeah. Um. Let's see, any plans to extend into Mexico and Latin America? Bitcoin for remittance would be a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we'd, love, we'd love to expand. So you might have seen, you know, three weeks ago we expanded into um, Europe. We launched in about, what was it, 13 or 15 countries or something. We added yeah. another five after that. Um, we're definitely on a, a move right now to try to launch and become available in more countries. Um, we've had some efforts in that area and like I hope we have something more to announce soon, but 
I, yeah, U.S. to Mexico as a corridor for remittance is huge. It's I think it's one of the top three, and um, that's something we'd love to to serve. So a lot of it's about getting the regulation figured out, getting bit local bank partners, um, and our BD team. We have a whole team of people who does nothing but this now. Uh, as Fred mentioned, we've got about 50 employees here in San Francisco, another 45 or so that are doing support around uh, the globe. And um, there, we have a whole team now devoted to nothing but international growth, forming bank relationships. Um, they, there's a, people at Coinbase have uh, been pounding the pavement, kind of flying all over the world, meeting with, with lots of banks, lots of regulators. And um, it's something we're just going continue, to continue to do more of. So um, there's a question here from Eric Voorhees. We should, let's see. What do you got? Um, when BitLicense requires Coinbase to know name and address of every user, will you consider blocking New York instead of spying? That was, that was kind of a hostile question, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I think fair, a fair question, but a hostile. Yeah, short answer is I think there are some things in the BitLicense where, um, I mean, to be honest, like it's it's pretty hard to write regulation on Bitcoin given that it's, I mean, it's like the early days of the internet, right? Like, if you're trying to regulate something where you can't see all the potential implications, it's naturally dangerous. Um, in terms of, like, needing to know name and address on everything, I'd, uh, I'd hope that's not the case. But it's, like, it's usually volume-based, right? Like, if somebody's trying to, like, cash out or shuttle, like, $100,000 through you, then, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's pretty likely that that, that part is going to remain regulated. Yep. The stuff that's internal to the Bitcoin network, I would, I would hope no, and that's kind of what, what we've really been pushing for. And that was part of, um, you might have seen that we, we actually just open, well, open sourced. I don't know if that applies to a legal letter, but we, we released our, our legal letter to, um, to the DFS publicly. Um, I think our basic goal is we think it's unlikely that if you're kind of like gateway to the network, so to speak, in other words, somebody who's handling people's money to exchange Bitcoin for local currency, it's pretty likely that you're going to be regulated. But um, stuff inside the Bitcoin network, um, I would, I'd hope not, because that's where we think you know, code and awesome programmatic stuff should be let to kind of um, to build. Yeah, agreed. I, I think I, Fred said it. Correct. It's probably not going to end up in the current draft of, of what the BIS license is. I mean, something more likely will be sort of what is required of money transmitter licenses, where there's some thresholds, um, and above that, yes, they're going to ask you to collect identifying information. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of the name of the game if you want to integrate with traditional financial systems, and I feel like that's how Coinbase can help bring the most value to the Bitcoin ecosystem. So if you want to see um, that part of Bitcoin get easier to use and onboard a ton of new people. You know, we've got 1.7 million people out there using the wallet now. Um, that's kind of the route that we have to play, but we love the fact that there's other people in the ecosystem playing other roles and doing it differently and, you know, operating in other countries where there's different regulatory environments, right? There's, um, in a global economy, you can, all those things can compete with each other now and, um, you know, users and innovation will go where, where it's easiest. Right, and Condition Delta wants to know when are you sending out the moon shirts for value customers? <laughs> yeah, we should put these up for sale. Aren't these cool? We've been we've been wearing these internally, but um, we should make like a uh, a store where people can buy like some swag, you know, even if it's like kind of coin basey. So yeah, I I guess we could we could remove the branding, I suppose, even too. That probably would be. I mean, not that I obviously love Coinbase, but um, <laughs> even with the, even without the Coinbase, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Somebody asks uh, or says, Fred, you do smile. It's a rare occurrence. Why do but, people yeah. think you don't smile, Fred? I don't. Um, I think you smile a lot. I don't know. I, I guess like I'm generally kind of a serious person. I, I I don't know. That being said, like it's a little bit of a binary thing. I'm either usually like super serious or I'm or I'm really goofy. Like I play a lot of video games and mm -hmm. I like yell at the screen a lot. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. I I don't know. He's an, he's an intense dude. It's, uh, but he does smile. I can assure you. Yeah. Um. Another so another one from Mr. Tende on on uh, Twitter. Can Africa ever expect reputable companies like Coinbase to service our needs? Countries like Uganda are desperate for legitimate players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think there's like Bitcoin is in a bit of a weird state right now where um, the technologists oftentimes are in pretty prosperous or uh, or well developed countries, right? Like the United States is where a lot of 
Bitcoin entrepreneurs are at the moment. There are you know, some in Europe and, and slowly, I think it's awesome sprouting up in other countries too. So um, I feel like something's going to happen here where um, basically these and banking and payments rails in some of these other developing countries, which actually need it more than the ones where the entrepreneurs happen to be at the moment. So yeah, I mean, I would, I, I have to be honest, I'm not super knowledgeable about what it's like to enter a local market in Africa, but um, I'd like to, and if it's not us, I hope somebody else does. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, if you think about like technology as basically like trying to solve a problem where you're significantly better than the next best alternative, if that's where the next best alternative is, is the worst, then hypothetically it should be one of the first places where people expand to. Yeah. All right, I feel like we should just, we should try answering like five questions rapid fire, like 10 second answers or less. Okay, okay. you gonna try it? All right, when explaining to Fortune 500 companies, what do you tell them about how to help their customers? Um, basically like you're paying way too much for payment processing fees right now and you don't know it. Also you're victim to this giant like tangled network of payment methods which is dumb, you need one unified one. Is Coinbase profitable or not? If not, when? Um, it's happened to be profitable at times. At the moment, it's not, but it's like we're not burning too much cash. Um, I think like the basic idea here is just to like grow, and by us growing, we help the entire ecosystem grow, and da da da. da. So, without dying. So, not at the moment, but not far. Do you have any plans to reduce your one percent fee for buys and sells? Um, I think it's inevitable. Um, like in the immediate, immediate future, not necessarily, but. Um, it's kind of like foreign exchange markets developing or something like that, right? Or just any time you get a market, Bitcoin is awesome because it's a completely open network where it's like free competition, multiple people enter, all that good stuff. Fees generally go down and the consumers, or in this case the merchants or developers, whatever it is, are are the big winners. When are we, um, when are we coming to Canada, Fred? When are we coming to Canada? Yeah. I assume if like for services, not for like us happening to go to Ontario for funsies. I like Canada. Um, I, I, we I, should go to Canada. I like Canada too, actually. A little, a little ski trip um, okay. When are we coming to Canada? Um, I I actually don't, uh, I'm not trying to be like cryptic, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't know though. Yeah, that was good. Did you, if you guys liked the, the rapid fire, let us know. <laughs> or if you want the in-depth, you know, heartfelt, emotional responses, we can do that too. Um, okay. Um, Oh, do you plan to release an iOS app directly from Coinbase rather than rely on a third-party app? Mm -hmm. um, yes, we would like to do that. Um, there's some good community-contributed apps too, but obviously we'd like to release our own as well. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Do you, let's see. Um, oh, can what, you touch on hiring John Collins? Yeah, and what you hope he might accomplish. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I, all right, I'll jump into that one. Sure. So, um, you know, government, if you look at uh, companies like Uber or Airbnb, they invested a lot in this early on. They have people who form relationships in uh, the state level, the federal level, and that's a way that you can do accomplish a couple things. One, you can be an educational resource to these regulators so that um, if they see something happening that they don't like, their first reaction is not a cease and desist letter, it's a phone call to you because there's somebody that you know. Number two, um, when it does come time for them to make some kind of decision about policy or something like that, um, then you have an opportunity to have a have a voice in that debate, right? So, you know, it's funny because like a lot of um, Fred and I both studied computer science and economics. We're kind of hard, and like I think our first reaction before starting a company was probably been like, um, well, you know, what do government relations people do? They just like have a lot of meetings and they talk all day. And, like, what is that? But it actually, you know, it turns out it's very important to build relationships. And in the past year, two years, um, that's been like a key reason that Coinbase has done almost everything is the relationships we've built. It's it's why we've gotten bank deals signed. It's why we've gotten Dell and Expedia and these guys signed up. Um, it's why we've been able to interface with regulators. So uh, long story short, John Collins is there to um, help be a, an advocate and a voice for Bitcoin generally. And uh, um, he can help Coinbase in that process as well. Yeah. I, I mean... It's, there are a lot of people who um, could use just like a really basic level of education on Bitcoin. I think like, and I've, I've gone and talked to a lot of like public officials face to face, 
Like the, the consistent thing you find is that once you, um, you explain Bitcoin and the value prop, you very rarely get people who are still skeptical or want to take negative action. It's usually just like a lack of upfront understanding and admittedly the media hasn't helped us a ton to this point in time. So uh, yeah, I view his role as education probably more than, more than anything else. Yeah, here's one good one, okay. Um, Gecko on, uh, on Reddit, isn't 16% fees on purchasing $1 of Bitcoin a bit excessive? How are you gonna help get these banksters to stop raking us over the coals for small purchases? Wait, are we the are we the banksters in that? I'm um, oh, or or it's or we're the pass through the banksters. One, you can interpret it that way, I guess. Okay. Sim is this because of our fifteen cent? I'm, I think that's I think oh, that's what it's okay. getting at. Yeah. Um, we actually decided to remove that. By the way, there'll, there'll be an update coming out soon that just makes it one percent without the the bank fee. So I don't know if that helps answer your question, but hopefully, it does. yeah. Ba basically, it'll be one cent soon. Um, <laughs> because yeah, we think it's it's kind of like um. It, right now we pay miners fees on behalf of users. It's kind of the same idea, right? Like our goal is basically to make this this stuff, to make Bitcoin as easy to use as possible. So um, if you can do things like remove miners fees or like these little obscurities, like I agree, like ACH fee that like most people probably don't want to have to think about, then um, we should probably do that. And it's in our best interest, frankly, because we want people to use the product because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, here's one from the, the original Reddit AMA post. Um, when will you be implementing multi-sig so you can't actually gox your customers? <laughs> I like that one. Um, so yeah, we've been working on multi-sig for a while. In fact, we already have it released through the API, which is something only developers can use, so that's not particularly helpful to the end customer. But um, we, uh, you know, we've been using the multi-sig you know, vault that we created internally. We've been all testing it over the last couple weeks, so Fred and I, I mean, I feel like we should uh, hold up a little screenshot of it and a sneak preview for you right here. Um, but yeah, it's we're, we're testing it internally right now. We hope to have it out in the next couple weeks, I'll say. Um, these things are always really hard to guess the exact launch time frame. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, once that's, once that's possible, it's going to be awesome. You're, you'll be able to control your own private keys um, and use Coinbase. We'll, we'll uh, have that as part of our vault feature because, of course, um, you know, there really is a trade-off to having you know, that, that privacy um, and that security um, of, a, of a vault type product. And then you can do other things with a wallet type product. So we think of our wallet and vault, it's a very important distinction. The wallet is kind of like the wallet in your pocket, right? You might have to hold a hundred bucks in there or whatever um, you might carry around. And that's good to have because it allows you to do um, more seamless integrations. Like if you want to ever pay for your Uber rides or like, you know, your Netflix subscription or something like that with Bitcoin, those are all subscription based products that will need to be able to, you can grant them permission. They can debit your account every month. Or if you want to auto pay um, your rent and have that automatically go out, those are kind of um, uh, pull type payments or debits, which a lot of things in the world run on today still. And um, Bitcoin isn't like that underneath. It's it's fundamentally a push payment, um, which you know you sign with your private key, you broadcast it out to the network. That's great, um, but for it's not always that convenient. And so we want to have the best of both worlds. If you want to store you know hundred million dollars of Bitcoin and be in control of your private keys, you'll be able to do that. You can already today through the API, but we're coming out with a much more easier easier way to do it, more easier, an easier way to do it. Um, and if you want the convenience of having just a really simple um, sending ability for your wallet, your day-to-day -day spending money, we have that too. So long story short, we don't want to gox anyone. We don't want to, we want to give customers the power to choose either one. Yeah, uh, I mean, similar question from uh, Bra Whale on Twitter. I think there's a big debate of storing Bitcoin with central groups versus individuals storing their own. Can you address it? I think that that lays out a lot of the thesis for it. I I think like the one um, the one thing that a lot of people who are like pretty deeply embedded in the Bitcoin community um, might not think about at times is that there are a lot of people who aren't super technical, and at least in our view, it's actually probably more dangerous for them to store their own Bitcoin at times or have to use more technical solutions than let somebody who's um, who kind of does it for their job or as their company, i.e. Coinbase, um, to, to let them do it for them. Or frankly, they might not even use Bitcoin if they had to get into the level of detail of like knowing what a private key is or how to store it or how to like back it up or, or, or things like that. So um, I think there's like a there's like a healthy balance there, right? Where um, 
it's some combination of like making a good cold storage solution um, like we have built in the background of Coinbase accessible to people through a simple web app. And for people who want to store their own Bitcoin, that's totally fine too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to drive the point home on that too, like one more thing. Um, you know, if you look at email, right, as an example, anybody could run their own email server if you're technical enough, right? Like, you know, we could set it up, but I don't really want to run my own email server. I, I want it to be simple. I want it to be the uptime, the backups, the security to be handled for me. So we use Gmail to do that, right? And even if you are, if you're technical and you know you want to do it yourself, because you know money is a bit more serious than email for sure, um, then you should do it. And we want to have that ability there for anyone who wants it. But email would have never gone mainstream if everyone had to set up their own mail server, right? Um, so we wanted to build Gmail and help bring it to the masses. Um, that was the right trade-off for us to make. So anyway, that's a little bit of our thinking on that. Okay, maybe one I'll I'll address. Um... BTC is God uh, on Reddit. What percent on average of volumes uh, do you buy, sell um, onto exchanges and which ones do you use? So um, we're in a bit, and this, this isn't by accident. Um, but we're kind of these, these natural sellers as well, right? Um, so it, it turns out that we can internalize or like internally offset about two thirds of our flow and only need to go out to um, exchanges or even other people in the ecosystem, you can probably guess it, who some of them are, um, to offset that remaining, let's say one third of, uh, one third of flow. I don't want to necessarily like endorse certain, uh, certain people or not, but that's, that's kind of the basic concept behind it. Um, so it makes, we're we're in a bit of a position of luxury, at least for now. Ranty, this is not not a question. Okay. Um, <laughs> one other thing I've I've had like some people ask me IRL, um, and I've seen on on Reddit occasionally too, is this concept of more merchants coming on board in Bitcoin and that causing selling pressure or like the price to go down? Um, it's like one of the larger um, merchant processors. I really don't think that's true. Um, yeah. I I think that um, well, one like the volumes of merchant processing they're not negligible, but they're not super high, especially when compared to just people who are kind of buying and selling Bitcoin. And like the trend is going in the right direction there, but in absolute terms, that's still true. Um, yeah. So I think that's I think that's largely largely a myth. Yeah. Here's an interesting question on Twitter. We got, what is the distinction between uh, the 1.7 million users and 1.9 million wallets on, you have on the site now? Have you had an uptick in wallets from the Euro expansion? Um, so yeah, I mean, we decided to break out the two numbers. Uh, we, you know, there's 1.7 million users who've signed up. Obviously, those users are people who, you know, most of them have connected bank accounts or completed some basic KYC. Um, but when you sign in as one user on Coinbase, you can have multiple wallets. You can also have a wallet and a vault or any combination or multiple of those. So we decided to kind of break out the separate metric um, just to kind of highlight that point that one user could have multiple wallets. Um, <laughs> you got a good one? I gotta go, yeah, okay. ra rapid fire question from Promo Coder Inc. Rapid fire question, is Coinbase insolvent? No, we are not <laughs> insolvent. Next question. I love that. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, we have um, we have financial auditors in the office at the moment who uh, who are verifying that. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Here's here's one uh, from Tracy Toops on on Twitter. All right. What's Coinbase's plan for the future as the company keeps growing? Is the sky the limit? Will you go public? Hmm. Um, the sky is not the limit. The moon is the limit. Um, but uh, yeah, we'd like to go public someday. Why not? I mean. I think this thing is just in its infancy, right? Like if you think about um, kind of like having a visa in everyone's pocket, I mean, why can't there be someone's concept of a wallet or something like that and have Coinbase sitting right there inside? So um, there's, you know, another interesting stat. Okay, there's 2.5 billion people in the world who have a bank account and there's like 7 billion people in the world total. It's 2.5 billion people who don't have a bank account. Really? Yeah. It's like, no, no, it definitely is. How do, how do like 5.5 billion people have a well, it's, bank account? Well, it's, that's it's, a lot of bank accounts. It's, that's a decent amount of bank accounts, yeah. Wow. All right, we'll, anyway. we'll split the difference. Okay. Somewhere between 0 and 7 billion people have a bank account. But the rest of those people, a lot of them don't have a bank account. 
they have a cell phone, right? A smartphone, increasingly. There's like two million Android devices signed up every day. Mm -hmm. So, like a lot of people, we think their first their first bank account, quote unquote, is actually going to be some kind of like virtual currency app running on their on their mobile phone, their smartphone, right? So that's cool. We want to be we want to be helping people get that on their phone and, and allow them to preserve wealth and you know have financial money transmit money to anybody who we want around the world. So um, anyway. That's a little off topic, but yes, we want we want to go public someday. All right, here's one for uh, for you, Brian, from uh, Dill Pickle Chips, awesome name on Reddit. Um, yeah. Do you feel a change to bits is something important for mainstream acceptance? Yeah, I mean, so we launched uh, the option for people to choose bits on Coinbase. Um, you know, I think it's like it's a little early. Like we all switched in the office. We switched to bits when the when the thing came out, and I used it for. I actually didn't. You didn't? No. Okay. I used it for like a week or two, and. It was like, it was cool, but like I couldn't think in those numbers. I think it's just because I've been using Bitcoin numbers for so long, but they were also just like really big numbers. It's right on that cusp, and you know, of course, the price came back down a little bit in this rebuilding period. So I think you know, if if we go back over a thousand or something in the near future, I think it's going to become it's going to become a much better idea. So short answer is yes, it's a good idea. A little early still, maybe. Yeah, I feel like we actually might have a bias on that one too. Like. Mm -hmm. I've always thought in Bitcoin terms, just because it's like we've been around it for like a couple of years now, right? So, yeah. And we also, I mean, like I, I'm biased when I use Coinbase. So yeah, I use like the dollar field if I want to send somebody, you know, fifteen bucks for something, and I, I feel like I actually don't really have to interact with it that much, so I just That's kind of ignore point. it. Yeah, we um, you can use the dollar field. So, but I recognize that like that n might not be the case for everybody, and then like. It's definitely true when I like send Bitcoin to like friends who don't necessarily have it, and I like ask them if I can pay them back in it or whatever. They're like, "Oh, this is annoying. Like, fifteen dollars right now is point zero three nine two three Bitcoin." Like, yeah, it, it's a legitimate point. I think I think it's it's probably an inevitability. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. Tweet your tweet your questions uh, to at Coinbase if you want them answered. So um, let's see. Here's another one. What are the top five sites that you us personally that we use to keep up to date on Bitcoin news? I mean, we. I like Bitcoin. I like the subreddit. Um, on on yeah, the Bitcoin subreddit is probably the best. Yeah. Um, we use CoinDesk. Uh, we look at some things like that. They're they're writing a lot of good articles. Um, Bitcoin Talk is like a little hit or miss. I mean, the uh, the upvoting on Reddit is like a is a simple feature that actually curates pretty good content. Yep. Um, on that's like I really the only two I've, couple sites. I think I there's use. actually like. I'd say Twitter is actually really good too. Oh, like yeah. I follow. I mean, so again, admittedly highly biased, but mm -hmm. um, Balaji Srinivasan on Twitter I think is is awesome. Mm -hmm. Mark Andreessen will say some good stuff occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. Um, well, he he talks about a lot. I don't yeah. think like the Bitcoin stuff he talks about is usually good. Occasionally about Bitcoin. Okay. Um, what else? I feel like there are other people that I'm like that I'm missing on this one. Um, I don't know. Like, who are, are there other people that like? I, I feel like we we Dan Romero on our team. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy Dan yeah. Romero on our team who I actually think is is really good. Lots of tweet um, storms. Barry Silbert is is usually good with just like general keeping up to date stuff. Um, I'm like going through and looking at the people that I follow now. Um, okay, who else? Anyway, sorry. Well, keep, yeah, keep, <laughs> gone. keep keep it rapid fire. Yeah. Um, all right. Will you be trying to encourage remittances with the international expansion, or even build ben remit board? Anyway, ben Davenport's good too. Yeah. Um, will we be trying to encourage remittances and um, international as part of international expansion, uh, or are we going to build remittance specific features? Uh, to be honest, to be decided. I think. I think the. Um, so the goal. Uh, how do I say it? so Europe is a cool launch because it's like it's a really big economy um, But as a remittance corridor the US to Europe is not particularly large in comparison to others Especially on like a per capita or a per GDP or whatever you want to use to compare basis um, So I think our like our basic goal and you might you might feel differently um, I think like the basic goal is just like go lay the infrastructure to make it at least possible first. So, like, we need to, or somebody else, right? Like, the beauty of the Bitcoin network is you only need half from one company and half from another. Um, I think the goal is to, like, basically build out the infrastructure everywhere so that it's at least possible. And then, um, 
the UI layer on top of like this is a remittance product probably probably comes after that. Yep. Um, Flipper Marketplace is saying we didn't answer this question. Do we, <laughs> do we market sell the coins on exchanges? And if not, or, or not, and if so, which ones? Like, yes, we we internalize some, we sell some on exchanges. The, we the, use all the big ones. The the answer specifically with selling is 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 actually. Actually, no. In almost all cases, though, and the reason why is like Bitcoin's a growing network, um, which means that more people at almost all, well, on almost all days, are uh, more people are entering the network rather than leaving. Fancy way of saying more people are generally buying Bitcoin than they are selling. So um, it's rare for us to actually have to go out and sell Bitcoin that are coming through from merchant orders or things like that. I mean, it's not to say it never happens, but it's rare. Yeah. Here's a good one. Um, Apple Pay launches on Monday. Do you consider that a serious threat to Bitcoin as an easy, secure payment platform? So Apple Pay looks interesting uh, as an easier way for people to pay, but it's not a threat to Bitcoin in any way. Um, it's all built on the same underlying rails, which is credit cards in this case, right? So um, you know, Fred and I see this a lot, that a lot of uh, innovation that's happening in FinTech, so to speak, it's all happening kind of like up higher in the UI layer, as we like to call it. So it's things like Venmo, Square, um, you know, uh, the PayPal wallet even. Like those things are all like building interesting point of sale devices or interactions with customers or Apple Pay is an example of this. But none of them are innovating in the rail, the payment rails that are underneath. And like, it's actually interesting. This is a good reason why a lot of those products all look kind of similar. Like if you look at processing credit cards with PayPal, um, versus first data, they all are like about 2.7% plus 30 cents, and they're almost identical. It's almost like when you go to the airport, you can choose any airline you want, but they're all flying the same Boeing 747 jet, and like you got the only thing you can compete on is like cookies and free bags or whatever. Um, so, you know, to us, that's like a huge opportunity because Bitcoin is now a new rail underneath. It's more competing with like Visa or MasterCard or like Western Union and these um, kind of Swift Wire. Yeah, or wire transfers or like even that is unfair because it's the only yeah. way the network. Right. But for pure payment purposes, yeah. So in other words, we think and hope that eventually uh, many of these kind of like consumer facing or business facing UI layer type apps like um, like Square or uh, Apple Pay will all be adding Bitcoin support in the future. So anyway, that's our that's our view on it. Troy Murray on Twitter agreed. Andreas is also on the phone Twitter too. I definitely do. Colin DeLarge, um, another um, Brian, are we going to issue any 1099s to U.S. customers for 2014? Um, merchants, uh, specifically, uh, yes, I believe that is the plan. Average consumer, not necessarily, but um, the idea is like we can't like really give tax advice, but um, we try to create the easiest. Export possible. You guys might have seen this. Like you can have an account export that will dump it into Excel or I believe a Google spreadsheet, hopefully too, um, where you can like kind of look at your um, look at the cost basis of all your Bitcoin. This is part isn't too annoying. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's a little annoying that the IRS um, called Bitcoin property. My understanding is that if you actually look at what's on the IRS rule books, anything. Um, Basically, they can only call things currencies which are issued by a sovereign entity. So I think there was like a bit of a public misconception around that ruling when it came out. Um, anyway, a long way of saying like hopefully Bitcoin taxes aren't too bad because it's all done through software and you should be able to automate all of it naturally. Um, yeah. And that's our first attempt at it. It's probably like I've used it myself. It's like good, not great, I'd say. Um, so hopefully it gets better with time. This is a funny question. Um, who came up with the idea to name your new node that supports like Bitcoin Toshi, who basically who decided to name it Toshi? So one of our developers, Adrian, came up with his name. Like I didn't really like it that much, and I don't think I, I, I actually I tried to veto it. To yeah, we thought it sounded like Yoshi the dinosaur, or like too serious. And then um, like every developer on the team basically thought it was awesome, and so we we got outvoted as the founders. Um, so anyway, I don't know, actually. I'm just curious if, like, if you're on Twitter, uh, tweet it out, like, whether you think whether you like the name Toshi. You can go check it out, Toshi.io as well. This is like our open source, um, enterprise grade Bitcoin node that lets you um, talk to the Bitcoin network, and you can store everything in a SQL database. You can build web apps on it. Um, lots of cool stuff like that. So, yeah. 
Um, let's see. Um, this is uh, so Ryan Butler on Twitter. How are you guys encouraging your merchants to encourage their vendors to sign up so they can pay invoices in Bitcoin? Hmm. Their Any vendors. Teams? We've only we've only seen that a little bit, right? I mean, that's all. That was always our theory: is like merchants today are going to accept Bitcoin because it's in the credit card fees, whatever they would have to pay, and that's you know that's better than what they have today. But then, if they start to pass that benefit down the line, in other words, they don't have to cash it out to dollars or euros or the local currency; they can just keep it in Bitcoin and then start to pay some of their vendors or their contractors in Bitcoin. That that would be like this kind of domino effect that would cause Bitcoin to trickle down. Into more and more areas, and we've seen the very excuse me, we've seen the very beginnings of that already start to happen. So, like Overstock, for example, they were accepting um, Bitcoin, cashing out 100% of it to U.S. dollars, and then some of their contractors, in my understanding, started asking to get paid in Bitcoin. So that they're now keeping um, some percent. I think it's like roughly 10% in Bitcoin. Um, so we've started to see that a little bit, and of course, you know, Coinbase, we pay our you know, some people in Bitcoin as well. Um, so you early days. My books? No, that's, kind of oh, cool yeah, that's yeah, that's huge. Yeah, so um, Intuit has. I'm sure you guys um, probably a part of this has this product called QuickBooks. It's like what a lot of small businesses um, in the U.S. maybe internationally too. I actually don't know the reach. Um, use just to like manage their books and QuickBooks integrated um, Coinbase and Bitcoin, so you can send an invoice for like any of your uh, business invoices in Bitcoin and get paid in Bitcoin, which is pretty cool. Um, I think usage isn't like super high at the moment because when you think about like how Bitcoin has naturally evolved, it's usually like individuals who will like dip their toe in the water, try it out, buy some, et cetera. Um, businesses, it's like a little bit less natural for them to get in the ecosystem that way. So that's just like sort of kind of the laggards to consumers. The same dynamic is probably true here, but like there are the very yeah um let's see <laughs> oh, this, is, uh, this is awesome yeah um what's your uh, what's your bitcoin price prediction for um for 12 months from now moon from uh, barry redder on on twitter 12 months from now bitcoin price prediction yeah oh man uh Man, these are so hard. Somebody asked us this like six or seven, it was more like eight or nine months ago. So, now. Yeah, this, I think it was the beginning of December yeah. of last year. I think I said 10,000 at that time. So <laughs> we, got, we got a ways to go. <laughs> I, yeah. I, the hard part about this one is you might, I think you pr can probably more accurately predict the range than the exact price on the day because as we've all seen, there are wide ranges and that's like. A, that's a cop out answer. Uh, okay. Throw a price out there. Though? Yeah, all right, fine. Um, okay, so <laughs> what? Like October next year? Um, I think it's probably like I'll say like fifteen hundred bucks. Hmm. Twelve months out, something like that. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go four thousand, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, fifteen hundred might be a little low. I guess it's maybe the best way to think about it is in terms of market cap, right? Because with the price where it is right now, it's all just like pure speculation. Yeah, the price <laughs> where it is right now, market cap is like $5 billion, something like that. Is it feasible that it gets to like, it grows 6x? Well, uh, let's, okay, if you, if, you if you really wanna go crazy, if you 10x it to $50 billion, you're getting to $3,800 a Bitcoin. Is that possible in a year? That makes I'm lowering my estimate. Now. It's it's possible. I think it's a little high. So that's why I say like, does like 20, 20 billion sound feasible or twenty five? So you get to somewhere around like fifteen hundred to two thousand. Yeah, yeah, that seems reasonable. All right. Well, this is a good one. This is going to be some deep shit. All right. Um, what what was the most stressful time for Coinbase that you can talk about? Um. Huh? Um. There was, there was a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, like, I remember there was one day in 2013, um, there was a lot of sleep deprivation that happened, which made everything worse. Like, when you actually have been able to sleep eight hours, you can go through, like, a lot of stressful stuff. People, like, break down. We, the thing is, the website was kind of, like, constantly 
you know, we were struggling to keep it up and online, and we have this thing called pager duty that wakes you up in the middle of the night if, if, if the site goes down. Uh, and there was nights where we would get woken up like three times. It was like, it felt like we went through war because like we'd get an hour or two of sleep, boom, site's down, and you have to wake up and you have to try to clear the fog out of your head and like fix this. I remember we'd been doing this for what felt like two or week, two weeks or something. I remember there was only like Fred and I during this time period. How many customer, how many walls did we have? Um, this is like probably at a hundred thousand. Yeah, and we had, like we were about to bring on like our first per, our first employee Olaf, um, but uh, yeah, I mean there was sort of like a couple things manifesting. One was like we had some bugs on the website where people's balances were showing wrong for a bit. We were getting tons of hate like on Reddit and Bitcoin Talk and like um, hater news. <laughs> hater news. Um, there was like press articles coming out. People were tweeting like, "It's done. Shut it. Shut it down." Like Coinbase is over, <laughs> you know. And the, and you're sitting there. You've slept like three hours in the last two days. There's like maybe a thousand unanswered support requests that have come in in the last 24 hours. And like Fred and I working full time, we could answer maybe 300 in a day. And there's like a thousand coming in every day. So like you're just you're not even treading water. You're just drowning at that point. Um, I remember like having these moments of like fatigue where I was like kind of just like didn't want to go on and I wanted to just like just like curl up in a ball in the corner and like go sleep for a bit but it was like fuck this we can't do that like we're kind of you know inconveniencing all these people out there and the business could just like literally fail if we don't do something in the next 24 hours that dramatically you know we would like kind of just like dig deep and power through it. Like it was, there were some ugly, some ugly times. I think we still have like a little bit of uh, PTSD from those periods. That was like definitely, definitely the hardest like thing I think I've ever done in my life. So yeah. Um, I mean, maybe rather than tell another story, I think the, the cool part and like not to like try to turn it into a positive or whatever. Um, <laughs> the, the really cool part about that one is um, and like I'm sure a lot of people out there have interacted with customer support at Coinbase in one way or another way faster and this happened to like a ton of Bitcoin sites right it basically grew way faster than we ever thought it would and we like didn't have enough people to handle it basically so for customer support we had a couple options because Brian and I like basically we're spending 100% of our time on customer support just because there was so much happening and that's really bad because you can't actually work on the site and launch cool new stuff so um, we basically had three options. It was like option one was try to hire a bunch of customer support people locally here in San Francisco. And we quickly found that like we just couldn't, couldn't do that quickly enough. Option to like spin up a call center somewhere. And um, we felt like that didn't really fit with the brand. And like Bitcoin, if you want to reduce it quite a bit, it's like a scary new financial technology in some sense. Um, and it, it like it really just didn't go well. So option three. Um, we were kind of like had to think about it for a couple of days, and and finally I forget how who came up with it or how to be honest. It might have been Olaf actually. Might have been yeah, might have been Olaf. Um, I can't remember. Basically, what happened is we put uh, we made a a Bitcoin specific test in a Google Doc and threw it up on r slash Bitcoin actually, and like 150 people took it, and we interviewed the top decile of responders. It was like an automatically graded multiple choice thing. And ended up hiring about half of those. So like 150 people took it, interviewed 10, hired five, kind of a thing. Um, and we've like done this a couple of different times in um, over the last year and a half or so. And basically like have a customer support team that's kind of distributed all around the world who like it's like our Bitcoin. They like they love Bitcoin and they're super super knowledgeable about it. Um, yeah. And vastified to be honest in a lot of cases. Um, all right, Louis. So, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll, I'm done with that story. But that, that to me is like might be the coolest story at Coinbase. And yeah, yeah, we have a pretty epic support team. Thank you out there watching. We love you. So we got six minutes left. Uh, let's try to rapid fire through some more of these. So um, the single biggest Coinbase transaction ever is. I, I'm guessing. I'm assuming he means buy buy of Bitcoin. What's the biggest buy we've ever processed? Like a couple million or something. Um, yeah, yeah. Like some sometimes, if there are people that we like know well in real life or something like that, we'll um we'll help them out on on buying and storing. So a couple million, couple, couple million dollars probably. 
Uh, what video games do we play, Fred? Fred actually plays video. Fred, oh, all right, I'm gonna tell a story about Fred. Um, Fred, <laughs> Fred was the top ranked on the top ranked team for America's Army, um, which is a video game. When he was like 16 years old, he was the top ranked player, not nationally, in the world. If you ever want to um, tease him about that? But we play, we play <laughs> some uh, Call of Duty like um, Battlefield 4. Um, I play Hearthstone occasionally. Hearthstone. Oh my god, I can't believe you just admitted that. That's Titanfall. Like, that's embarrassing. Some people in our office play Magic cards a lot. I I actually, you know, had never played that. So you got some love from Eric Voorhees too, by the way. What did he Good say? Good AMA. Thanks for uh, building a prominent Bitcoin company. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. We, we like you a lot too, by the way. Yep, I'm a, we're we're definitely fans. We are fans. We definitely respect what you're doing too. It's mutual. Um. What um, I think. It depends how you count it. Basically, yeah, like if like ninety nine percent of our net worth is in Coinbase. Yeah, but, uh, if you don't count that, it's um, still really high. Like I actually, it's probably yeah. a borderline irresponsible to be honest. Like I feel like it's it's probably like forty percent of mine or something like that. Yeah, I'm uh, not like I don't have that much money. Yeah, it's a heard, mine's probably like twenty percent or t- something like that. I can't uh, remember. Well, your well, but I thought the price was gonna go higher. You said we're gonna go lower, so um, okay. Let's see. Do you pay employees in Bitcoin? Yes, we do. Hell yeah. Um, probably like forty percent of people at Coinbase get paid in that. Um, what service used for payroll? We used like a homegrown solution actually, that, because none of the ones out there supported it yet. So we made a little API app that uses our API, pays people in Bitcoin. Peter awesome. D. Gray likes Toshi, by the way. Nice. Thank you, Peter. Kind of want, I kind of want some hate or like a like an alternate suggestion for that one. <laughs> so, but yeah. How did Brian and Fred meet? Um, this is interesting. We we actually just met out in San Francisco. I started with trading FX in New York. Um, I was out here in San Francisco. Um, Fred saw the early thing come out on on Hacker News and uh, like a little prototype that I was working on, and emailed and, and we met up. We tried working together. It was like you know love at first sight. So um, actually that's not true. We worked together for a while and we 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 did some dating you know before the marriage. It was it was healthy. Um, here, here's an interesting one. When will users be able to buy items with uh, Bitcoin without buying Bitcoin first, aka in the background, you deduct from their checking? So logical 007 on Reddit. Ah. Um, well, you can do that in Europe right now, right? Yeah. Well, it's basically like we're letting you buy something with ACH, for example, in the U.S. So, or like whatever your local payment option is. Yeah. So it's interesting, like... There are two sides of that. Like one is you're not actually using Bitcoin per se in, in doing that. Um, maybe you are. I guess if the merchant is, uh, if it's like another merchant tools provider or something like that. Uh, there's something interesting in there basically where you're kind of like, the idea would be like the service brings together like a conglomeration of payment methods and you basically like select the best one. Like if you already have Bitcoin, then it's like, then it's free, instant, frictionless. Maybe it's like slightly more expensive or slightly slower or something if you have to use a local payment method. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> Do you get a bro hug from Eric? Oh, we got a bro hug. Thanks, Eric. Um, what else? Um, see, we, got, we got two minutes. Is there anything else like that we want to say, Fred, before we have to sign off? Two minutes. What do we mm. want to say to the, to the peoples of... Of Reddit in the Bitcoin community, I think like um, like one important thing to know is like a lot of basically our main objective is just to make Bitcoin as easy to use as possible. And there are times where like storage is a good example, or like by virtue of offering an exchange service, we have to um, like comply with certain regulations or stuff like that. Where um, we like we may or may not like it ourselves, but um, our main goal is just to make Bitcoin as accessible as possible. And um, like, I think my going back to the earlier question, my biggest source of news for Bitcoin is def is r slash Bitcoin. And it has been for three or four years now. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think like we definitely um, we're we, we like try to listen to that feedback quite a bit, even if it's not overly obvious all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's a very weird feeling to be reading Reddit or something. And it's like, People are saying all these things about you. It's like <laughs> either very positive or very negative, and like you know, neither one is really true. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. And I feel like 
Um, so we, we don't let the positive stuff get to our head, but we also try, have kind of had to develop like thick skin, honestly. We're like, you know, a little bit um, in the public eye at this point, um, which was a conscious decision that we made because we felt like the only way people, if they knew who the people were behind it, um, we haven't really always been super like public figures. And the reason is that, you know, we're super busy, right? It's like we're, we're trying desperately to keep this product up and running for you guys. Um, so that things work correctly, we minimize the bugs, and I feel like you know it's uh, there's some founders who they they have a company that starts to get used, and then they or it becomes popular, and they decide to kind of like go on the speaker circuit tour, you know, and like all they're doing is public appearances and interviews and like with the with the media, um, and they can kind of like lose focus of what the real thing is that they're trying to build. So um, we kind of never wanted to make this like about us as individuals we wanted to make it just like a successful product so if we've ever been a little bit um reclusive or something like that it's uh it's mostly because like we're barely sleeping enough to keep this whole thing running <laughs> um uh, to be fair that's not that, that hasn't matured for a little while and and yeah. the, the luxury is like we've been you know we have a great team of 48 other people around us so yeah that's um, that's true that that's very much changing now i shouldn't uh overstate it but i mean it's true. Like, I think we're actually going to have a bigger chance to do that now that um, we do have such an awesome team like that's able to um, help keep some of this running, and it's not like kind of always all hands on deck, like putting fire, putting out fires. So um, hopefully, we'll get to make more um, trips out to conferences and things like that, and get to meet more of you in person. But um, yeah, thanks for all the questions on Twitter. Are you done? I feel like there are one or two other good ones here. Too. Yeah. You yeah. Want Okay. Okay. Let's let's do three last ones. They're actually mainly from the same guy, BTC EE ninety nine. Okay. Couple of key ones. Where do you see the future of microtransactions? Okay. Real quick. Um, you know, microtransactions are have a lot of killer use cases. It's one of the big things for Bitcoin, but it just doesn't work if you have to pay minor fees. At least if we're talking about like one cent or less. So you know, we made this uh, feature on Coinbase off blockchain microtransactions that are free, instantly confirmed. Um, a lot of people have been using it. You could do it on blockchain. It doesn't really seem to be a way to do it today. So that's there are some good proposals yeah. for that though, where you like effectively. Um, I'm going to go back and read the, the cryptographic solution to it, but it's basically like you form one transaction, and then yeah, I yeah. believe you like send across the signature or something like that, and then you kind of like build up over time. I'm explaining this horribly. Yeah, but I think you have to pre-fund the coins or whatever. So yeah, yeah, that that, that part is definitely true. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Thoughts on identity systems on the blockchain? Mm. I mean, I think like distributed identity systems would be pretty awesome. Like, we're fans of all the stuff that people are making for that. Um, what is it, one name, bona fide? There's like, there's a bunch one name, of Keybase. Keybase. Yeah. I, I I think that's gonna be a huge deal. Um, basically, yeah. like the like one of the fundamental trade offs of Bitcoin is that it's irreversible. So it seems like identity is the natural pairing to that. Um, like nothing is super taken off yet, but I, I think that'll that'll definitely that'll yeah. definitely happen. Yep. Um, okay, maybe one last one. Thoughts on shielding used in price volatility? Hmm. Well, I don't know. We've we've experimented with a couple of, or thought about a couple of ideas like that, where you could kind of like lock in the local fiat vol you know value of your Bitcoin or something, and kind of just switch flip a switch really quick, where you could now be storing it in your local currency. Of course, people can do that manually today, right? All you have to do is buy and sell Bitcoin on the site. Um, but I think generally volatility, that quite, we get that question a lot actually from different people. We, there's two answers to it. One is that it's, it's mostly a self-correcting problem um, over the coming years. If you look at the previous three years, it's gotten less volatile. We think that trend will continue. There's a simple reason why. More and more people are coming into the Bitcoin ecosystem, so any kind of you know, price shock or negative news or positive news or whatever, Kind of affects the total pie less if as a percentage. Um, so I think volatility is a self-correcting problem, even if we did nothing. There's a lot of things we that we have done though in the short term to uh, fix that. So the simplest one is merchants can accept um, Bitcoin and they can use our instant exchange feature, and almost all of them use it today: Dell, Expedia, or Stocksquare. Um, so they can price all their goods in dollars or euros or local currency. Um, we're, we guarantee them that amount when they uh, when they receive the Bitcoin. We we instantly exchange it on our back end, um, and they get their dollars paid out at the end of the day, um, not at the end of the day's exchange rate, at the exact um, 
price of the good that they quoted in dollars. So it hasn't been a huge showstopper in the short term, and it's only going to get to be less over the long term. One, one other thought, too, is like um, uh, this is, right, is going to get super financy for a second. And, and by the way, I only, I only worked at Goldman for two years, so I don't feel like I'm too vampire squinty. Yeah. But maybe I'm like, I don't For the record, I am not a banker. <laughs> There's only one banker. I, I was a trader, too. I yeah, was a, a trader. Banker. It's, it's harsh, man. I did we're, computer science in undergrad. We're Come nerds. On. We're, Come on. We're huge nerds. Um, okay. So one other thought on that is um, like Bitcoin, the asset markets for Bitcoin are really nascent right now, right? So basically, as, um, as those develop, you could imagine something where like you have a Coinbase wallet and if you want to lock in the fiat amount for your wallet, like that's great, and then those are actually like Bitcoin that you or we or whatever can actually like lend out on the back end as a capital markets function, and like it's great for you because you lock in the um, the local currency value of your wallet, and it's great for the person on the other end because they just got to they got like liquidity and borrowing or something like that, and maybe you even earn interest on it. Like who knows? Um, derivatives kind of could do could do a lot of the same stuff. So. Yeah, I think it's like it's an inevitability. It's just like needs a little bit of a little bit of time to develop. Yep. One last thing is um, we are going to be hosting user meetups in Europe. So if you live in London, Madrid, Paris, or Helsinki, um, come out and register to visit with us. Um, you can go to our blog, blog.coinbase.com. We have the link there. Make sure you RSVP. Come have a drink on us, and you can come meet us in person in one of those cities over the coming week. So um, that's it. you have anything else? No, or you can just pour a beer on my side. That's fine, too. Yeah, um, if, you want to, if, you're, if you're really mad, you come pour a beer on my head. People are asking about the Tuna Moon shirts a lot. Maybe we actually need to. I think we to, should sell these, yeah. Sell some of those or something. These are awesome. Can you like open source t-shirt designs? Is that a thing? Um, Teespring. Yeah, we should Teespring these. <laughs> we should. Oh, okay. okay. All right, great. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks everybody. Yeah, um, we love you. Yeah, and maybe we'll, I don't know, maybe we'll do another one of these at some point in time. But yeah, if you guys liked it, let us know. It's been fun. Cool. Bye. Bye.